I should get my phone off this. You want to turn your phone off first? Okay. Howard? Okay, we're going to start now. Fellow Pelicans and friends of UWI, welcome to Pelican Talks, a YouTube live event where we promote interactive and positive discussion about a, a variety of topics and engage our UWI alumni across the Caribbean and the world. It is my very great pleasure to have as our special guest on Pelican Talks today, Mrs. Marva Bernard O.D. Welcome, Marva. Hi, Celia. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. <laughs> it's our honor and pleasure. So let me tell you listeners a little bit about Marva Bernard. Most importantly, she's a very proud Pelican and holds a Master of Science degree in accounting and a Bachelor of Science in Accounting and Economics from the UWI. And she's also a certified public accountant. So she's basically a financial whiz, folks. <laughs> Um, Marva was at the UWI uh, from 1966 to 69 when she did her BA. So in case any of you out there are listening and knew her, that's when she was there. And then she came back a little later and did her MSc in 1985 to 1986. She is currently the president of the America's Federation of Netball Associations, also called AFNA. Uh, after serving for many years as the president of Netball Jamaica. So Jamaicans, I'm sure, are going to be very familiar with her name. Now, Marva, your career has been fascinating, but we're going to start with your Caribbean roots and heritage. So let's start with your parents, where you were born, etc. Give us a little outline of you. Okay. I was born in Panama. My father was building the canal and for some reason, <laughs> which we all know Jamaican men are like that, he, he had two kids in Panama before me. And so my mother would have no more of that. So she went to Panama and I was born in Panama and came back to Jamaica when I was three months old. And so I have been a Jamaican since then the joke of it is that when I tried to, the first passport I had was signed. And then I had a Jamaican passport. And then when I tried to get my second passport, I couldn't get it. I had to be naturalized. So my husband had to sign the documentation to allow me to have a Jamaican passport. But I am, I have been here and here is where I am and I'm a Jamaican. That's interesting. Very good. So do you have siblings? Are there any other UA Pelicans in your family? No, I'm the only one, but my, my family, I'm very close with my family. Um, we are like a nuclear family. My two sisters who were born in Panama, I'm very close with, and my brother is here in Jamaica. I have one sister living in Panama, sorry, in Chicago, three sisters, one in Panama, one in the, and two in the USA. And oh, one brother nice. is here, yes. Okay. Okay, so now let's talk about Yui. Tell us about your Mona experiences. What has had the greatest impact um, about your lecturers, meeting students from all over the Caribbean, any co-curricular clubs you were in, anything that, that you want to tell us about your Yui time? So anything that the, the best years of <laughs> my adult life. I I have to I have to um sections, three sections of my adult life that I think are the best years. I will start with Yui, 1966 to 1969. I'm telling you, I do not know how on God's green earth I came out of Yui with a lower second degree. I, I spent my three years in Taylor Hall, the Hall of Halls, I would have, I didn't know. You see why I'm laughing? Because honestly, Celia, I had so much fun. I tell everybody, I came off of campus so slim. 
I would I have never seen those numbers again unless they appear in a spreadsheet because I spent three years having so much fun. I wondered how I passed anything at all. And then my other section was with Air Jamaica. And then my other section was with netball and managing the team because the greatest joy for me, but we'll get to that part of my life is managing the team. My life lessons were learned from being in sports administration. But I came on campus in 1960, the height of Mary Jones days. And I only went to the university because my parents said and the next thing after high school was you. But well, I had no choice. But I hated missing all the fun because in those days we were going to Mary Jones every weekend. So I hated being on campus and not going to the fence. So I would go home on Wednesdays, wash my clothes, get my clothes washed, and I would go back home on, on no, I, I went home every weekend before. Then I realized how, as you say, campus life nice. So I began to send my clothes home on a Wednesday to be washed because I wasn't leaving campus at all. As a bell appeared to be rung, at the union, me and my partner in crime, I'm going to call her name because I'm sure you know who she is, Cecile Clayton, <laughs> <laughs> my best friend on campus. We got into all the scripts, Cecile and I and my compadres in Taylor Hall. I don't know. So the first year, we didn't have semester at that time. So we could, we could really save all our studies until the end. So after year one, my parents only, I didn't get a scholarship. So my father was paying my way. So paid my way for year one and I stayed in Taylor. But I didn't know it was so much fun. I didn't want to go home in year two. So I know I've asked Father God to forgive me several times for this big, big fib. So I can say, no one say God has forgiven me. I told my father I had exams in the second year and I could not come home because I had to stay on campus and study. So guess what? In those days, you didn't have any exams in year two. No exams. Oh. So let me tell you where I spent most of my year two. Making costume and tailor and spending a lot of time in the union. We had a Algorithm band with Jeff Cobham and all those people, Howie Cooper. So as soon as Free Bertram, it looked as if they were going to have a fete. There we were. And it was in those days, see, that you could walk to the campus, the plains. You could walk freely all hours of night. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that saddens me now. So year two, I really built costumes and partied and went to classes. So you, there was so there was UE Carnival then. Oh, oh yes, oh yes, and we built costumes. We built costumes, and Taylor all had some of the most fabulous costumes. Marilyn Hamilton took the candelabra, and I remember it being out here and on the night when we went down to, to the, um, the hall, the thing began to break up in pieces and we just cried. But these guys from Trinidad, John McConney, and so were so creative, they patched it together. There was also a costume of a girl sitting in a wheelchair and they made her legs. Those days, it was so creative. So there was a whole movement in Taylor Hall to make these costumes. I remember... Um, Ron Sweet's wife, oh, she had this beautiful African costume from Sea Coal. But I'm telling you, we were, we were in those days free, carefree. We loved the life on campus. The books were secondary. I remember there's a lecturer called Marcia Sweet, Marcia McKinley. I always remember her, her skimpy African queen costume, right? Cecile and I made costumes. She did the arts and I did. And nobody in, not many people in Taylor Hall was doing my subject. So most of my batchmates were in Chancellor or in Irving. And I must call some names. I have to drop some names tonight because I want people to understand that 
we live at a time when we were able to balance fun and study. So there is Honorable Bruce Golding, Prime Minister, was in our batch. Gonzales, Ralph Gonzales was in our batch. We had the governor, the governor of the Bank of Jamaica, Audrey Anderson, was in our batch. Um, but, um, we have Howie Cooper, um, Everton McDonald. These people have made significant contributions to Jamaica's economic life and just well being. And it was a Vivian Crawford, a time to have been on campus where we had pantry raids, yeah. And the boys in, in Taylor would get up in the middle of the night and have a piece of pipe that they would beat the, the arms, the, 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 the railings of the block, and they would summon the girls to wake up. Ladies of block B, time to get up. And it, let me tell you something, Celia, I, I remember my campus days with so much, so much fun. I remember we played Juve one morning and I, there, was a, there was a skit with me and Molten Keen. So I don't know if you know this film studio called MGM. I was green at the time and there was Judah Ben-Hur. <laughs> I remember we walked down Chancellor Spine and the, to the sign that said, MGM presents Judah Ben-Hur. So every time I walked down the spine, Molten would bend me. And the sign was MGM, Marva Green and Molten presents Judah Ben-Hur. So those days, those days, Celia, I'm telling you, if you don't go to Carnival um, Queen Show early, you don't get a seat. So I remember my friend Clive Medwinter inviting me back to to, to the campus in, in 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 the eighties, I think after he came to Air Jamaica, and I went up onto the assembly hall at six o'clock, and I sat there, and nine o'clock, nothing is happening. Ten o'clock, nothing is happening. The, the children, the students, starting to come at eleven. So I'm saying, oh my god. And I remember Charlie Roberts saying to me, Mama, don't reflect. This is how it is now. But I'm telling you, the best years of my life, and guess what? We had to go to Gina in our gowns. Now I go back on campus and the dining room is not there anymore. And I promised Cecile that I would, you know, we, we, we got into so much trouble in, in, in hall, in dining room at Christmas dinner, that this is all the wonderful memories. That, as I say, I don't know how I passed anything. I had to take 13 subjects in year three. And remember, no, you know, I told my father I had passed four, just so he could make me stay on campus. I had four exams to take, and then when I parted my entire life away and I reported home, he said, how did the exams go? I said, I passed, passed what? I, I didn't take anything until in the end of the three years. That's when I had to buckle down. And I won't tell you the story of why I came off campus being 140 something, because I got a drink of tang in the morning in my room and headed over to the social sciences block where I stayed all night, passing the four subjects I took in year two that I didn't take plus the other nine that we were taking. It's a person for it. I know when to party. I party very hard. Celia, I also play very hard. So if you party hard like me, then you have to work hard. So whatever time I lose partying, and this prepared me for creating balance in my later life. So I tell you the best years of my life, my young life, were spent at the university. When I went back to do my master's, I simply went back to study and go home. Because I wouldn't you attached to hall. Right, and you were more mature then, so you could just settle down and work, right? Well, I, I, I still like to have a good time. So if <laughs> I was on hall, maybe I would have had a good time, but... <laughs> traumatic. So 
I really only had time. And I got a scholarship from Air Jamaica to go back on campus and do my master's because I had a bad experience um, in trying to matriculate for the MSc. Who we're going to, today is all about fun. But it also showed me that I tell the young people that I be with that they're not to give up, you know? Because I left Air Jamaica, I was bored. I left Air Jamaica and went to study and it wasn't working out for me. So they were calling me back. So I flew on campus and found four subjects to do that I thought would take me into the master's program, but I didn't apply. And Professor OJ said, no, <laughs> you have to matriculate. You have to do them all over. So all my lecturers were so sympathetic, but I buckled down and I got back the four A's I got when I had paid my way as a specially admitted student. And then when I went back to work, everybody was so sorry for me. And I figured my boss was even more sorry. He said, okay, guess what? We're gonna give you a scholarship to go, back to do your masters and you'll take 15, 16 months off from work and go and do your masters and come back. And that's what I did and came back to Air Jamaica where I spent 25 years. That was another part of my life that I, that really helped to mold me into who I am today. So I do, I, I'm a sticker. I stick to things, I don't flip. But um, Air Jamaica was special, but UE gave me an education so that I could go out and for me, it's a better job than the next person, but it also made me have lifelong friends, networking. I, I couldn't figure out the econ at all. So, and I didn't have parental guidance to say to me, okay, you know, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I went on campus, opened the syllabus. Hmm. and burners were not for me. I didn't do any sciences at that school. Hmm. Literature and English and Spanish, that's teaching, no money, nothing that. So I crossed, picked over those pages. Aha! Accounts and econ. But they didn't have to do econ to go in. So I said, this is for me. I could make some money here. But I can tell you, I went, I chose accounts because I didn't see at the time, young and foolish, that I, the first degree was really a launching pad. It helps you, to, it matures you. And it helps to focus you. Because as I told some girls that sent on to high school last week, most of my colleagues who were on campus with me that came from St. Andrew, they did the arts and ended up in finance, in banking, sector, insurance. So you see, what is where you start is not necessarily where you end up. And so I just went along. And as I said, I didn't have to ever apply for a job. I came into a job, worked hard, and somebody promoted me. And I worked hard, and I got another promotion. So it's so, been like that for me. Yes, that's a very good. And what you said was very true, that where you start in terms of your first degree is quite often in, in the real life, not where you end up. But it is, as you say, a really good launching pad and a way for you to find yourself and, and, and be qualified. So I know that you... Um, became involved in netball in about 1973, I think. But before I want you we talk about that, because you said that's your second best part of your life, I want to give our listeners an idea about the various professional posts you held, which they might not know and be interested in. So you, I see that you started in the income tax department as a trainee, right? And yeah. then from there, you ha had a little stint at SEPROD. So some folks might know you from your SEPROD days. And then you began at Air Jamaica, where you, I think, did several things, manager of revenue accounting, director of internal audit, et cetera. And then you went on to the Guardsman Group. You also worked with Burma Limited, Action Chemical and Equipment, which is a family business. And you also were the manager audit and compliance for FinSAC from 1988 to 2000, and also worked with the JIS, Jamaica Information Service, as Director of Finance. So I was correct, you are a financial whiz. <laughs> but let's, yes, let's I go- I very good books. Well, there we go. Very That's what people books. want. 
So let us talk a little bit, give a little bit of insight about Air Jamaica, because I know a lot of Jamaicans miss our national airline. And as you work there, perhaps you can just talk a little bit about that. I went, after we left campus, a number of us went to income tax. And then some of the ones who ended up in high finance or in audit firms, some went to the audit firm. I decided to go into SEPROD. I spent about a year at SEPROD. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I've always wanted to see the world. I've always wanted to travel. And I remember a colleague of, of mine who actually, who I don't, I don't remember if I'd met him from campus or what, he actually was at Air Jamaica at the time. So I said, anything comes over the air? And they said, yes. I said, well, okay, I applied. And it turned out to be the person in charge of the accounting department is an Excelsorian. He's actually um, a, a year or so be, below me, but I went for the interview and I remember December 1, 1970, my ID number is 700726. Dawn's my best friend, is 6842253. He joined in 68, you know, and I was in 70. My other friend Pam was 700723, which is the time when we joined. And I joined Air Jamaica to see the world. And that's exactly what I did when I was at Air Jamaica. We came off a plane and opened the OAG at the time, which was not computerized, called the Official Airline Guide. And we flipped the pages and see where we'd want to go. We go to the bank and buy 500 US dollars and we head out and go on a plane. We didn't even tell our parents where we were going because sometimes we weren't even sure where we were going or where we were going to stay. When we get to the airport, we look to see, you know, what which hotel we could afford to go and, and stay with the five hundred dollars that we had to shop and buy food. So I spent a lot of time. But when I went to Air Jamaica, actually a number of things happened to me. I went as a clerk, and I was given a desk that had to account for the aircraft parts, and those didn't come often. So if a batch of parts came from Air Canada, would come to my desk and I would, I would do them. I remember a friend of mine was getting married at the time and things weren't going as smoothly as it should. And I was on the phone a lot. And I remember one morning, my boss, who was the person that was at school with me, <laughs> I do know what he was my boss, called me inside because we always said he could hear an elastic band drop on the carpet outside, right? And he called me and he said, um, you're on the phone a lot. And of course, I had a good reason to be on the phone a lot, right? And besides, the work that they gave me wasn't a lot. So I said, well, you know, I explained to him why I was on the phone and I finished my work. And he said, well, look, if you want to keep this job, you need to assess your work habits and how you are performing. I said, if the, the, the bills don't come in, the aircraft parts don't come in as often. He wasn't interested in that. So I came out and said, no, so this is what I want to do. I want to travel. I mean, I see, I, I, I see myself and my touring partner going all over the place and I lose this job and can't do that. So I, you know, I, I listen. And I looked across at a colleague of mine, a young fellow, he was in charge, he was doing papers. And the poor fellow just couldn't finish. The papers couldn't finish. And not even thinking about saving my job, but you know, you reflect and you introspect that when the, the bills came in from Canada and they finished what we were going to do next. And I just reached across to Howard and I said, can I help? And after that, I began to have more time to do Air Jamaica's work and less time to be a marriage counselor. And I went away to, the, to New York for a weekend and came back and heard that I was, the boss made me supervisor of payroll and payables. 
and he wanted somebody to do payroll. And I had a friend who used to do payroll at another Excel story and at some place. I knew he was into payroll. And I knew that my best girlfriend was at separate and I said she could be in Pebbles. So I said, there are two vacancies here. And I went for them. And that is something I reflect on even today because I, I don't know everything, Celia. And I will always find somebody who is better at what I do and bring them come. So my two best friends got jobs at Air Jamaica, one in charge of payroll and one in charge of, of, of another statistical section that we were being, that was being developed. So I learned how to manage people now because if I'm a supervisor now, and also when I got that position, I supervised it, I was coming from outside of the payroll entity and it didn't go down so well. So I had to bridge those gaps of with people who would have loved to have been promoted and didn't get it. So I had to had to 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 to, to draw on my my own resources to help people to overcome disappointment. And I remember I, I look my family, my father is has a sense of humor. And my mother is very long suffering. So I use those two character traits at Air Jamaica, and they are taking me through life now, still as it. But I learned how to manage people. So you would know my best friend, Dawn. She was in the, 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 the revenue section that dealt with the tickets, accounting for the tickets. And I was over on the other side dealing with payroll and accounts payable and those things that I studied or didn't study, but I was able to, to, uh, to, to come out and learn how to, to utilize my, my, my campus um, studies. And one day the same boss, the young fella from Excelsior who became my boss called both of us. And he said, okay, Monday morning, John, you are going to be the manager of Marva section, which is payroll and payables. And Marva, you are going to be the manager of Dawn section, which is a tickets and accounting for the tickets. Now, see, by this time, only thing I know about a ticket is things on a plane, right? I don't know anything about pricing, cost, and accounting for these airline revenues. And I was so scared of asking him, why are you switching me and Dawn? Dawn is doing this and she's a manager and you're putting me to do what she do and I don't know what the cons about accounting for tickets. Years after I learned from him because I, I, it bothered most me and Dawn why but I suspected after a while that when I went into revenue accounting with 65 people I can't talk about it now. They were dealing with Obia. They were dealing with who not talking to who. They were dealing with all kinds of issues, staff issues. And I guess Mr. Smith thought if he put Dawn in there, she would just trace off everybody and just tell them. So he sent me with my father personality and my mother temperament, right? Into this 65 this massive department with all these personalities. But guess what? Again, I'm learning how to deal with different types of people. In the end, we party hard, we party at Christmas, we have staff weekend. We Listen to me, Air Jamaica was family. And eventually me and my 65 people, Christmas party, we out of everywhere. Staff weekend, we Upper Castleton. We were a family and to this day we are still family and i think i think family, that all yes. of these experiences helped me to be where i am today and to deal with all of these personalities that i have to do but i enjoyed i would have stayed at Air jamaica and swept the floor if they didn't make me redundant in 1990 <laughs> some ever four yeah i wouldn't yes leave. yeah well i think that that whole family vibe translated into the service and into the whole Air Jamaica experience because Jamaicans felt like we were at home when we were on board Air Jamaica. And I think and even you know I flew? I flew as a flight attendant once. 
Oh, very good. Very good. My weight, yes. <laughs> Come, Mr. Sangunet, you only wanted slim girls in short skirt, but guess what? The mother strike. Oh, and those okay. of us on the ground who love the airline said, all right, we're going to strike. We will keep the thing afloat until you finish fight and strike and everything. And I signed up to be a temporary flight attendant. There we go. There we go. And I had a better appreciation of their job. I had two calluses on my toes from two flights. Oh my goodness. I left home one morning at four o'clock. And those days you weren't in flat shoes. Right. And right. I remember having some a, a nice rubber bottom shoe that I thought was comfortable, but I didn't recognize the stitching around the top. This is what I did. 21 to Miami, full of farm workers. Come back as 20 empty. Walk through the airport, come back, go back around to 24. Go back to Miami the same day. Walk to the airport. And by the way, this is a full flight of farm workers. Okay. And then you come back around. 1054. So when I reach home the next year, I said, I'm an accountant. Love the flying, but not as a flight attendant. No, it's a very diff it's a very difficult job. And they as well yeah. deal with personalities. Actually, I have a comment coming. Some a graduate in Barbados is listening in and saying that this has been very interesting because um, it's a very important to learn how to deal and manage with people no matter what profession you're in. So they're, they're picking up some pointers. But as we were speaking about um, netball, we're going to talk more about that because you became the manager of the Air Jamaica netball team. And did you play or did you just, just managed? Well, my dear Celia, truth be told, I've been a fluffy diva all my life. My best friend Dawn, we are fluffy divas, but she, plays the goal shoot position. I defended and I tell the story without feeling any way because it's true. Every time somebody slimmer than me came and they wanted to win, they took me out. I said, come. So I began to play goalkeeper because I couldn't manage anything outside the circle. Like Dawn, she was goal shooter. So she stayed inside the circle and you can't move her out. Not even with a pickaxe can you move over out right so she she was a shooter so eventually i took a job that nobody wanted i became the team manager i had the car so my car had to take them to training my car had to take them to matches so i have to be a part of this because i didn't want to be because by this time now remember these people are family we have become a family unit at here jamaica and we have a smaller unit now of netballers and I became the team manager, looking after the uniforms, looking after transportation, and I really loved that. Guess what? Nobody wanted that job, and nobody was taking me off of that position and telling me to go and have a seat and just cheer. So I became the team manager, and that's I very good. From here. And but I and you you stayed with them for about twenty one years, right? Twenty-four, don't show. Twenty-four. Me. Twenty-four years. Oh I wow! Okay. Jamaica, but we weren't playing netball for. Yeah, we were playing netball for about eighteen of all of those years. Yeah, and we are okay. still friends. All of us who played on that team, or during that time, are still friends today. Just Wonderful. like we are all friends at Air Jamaica. We have our own little family. My husband says it's a lodge. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but what I find interesting is that you um you were obviously very involved in netball and you had all kinds of, of positions in the netball world, but you were also involved in different associations. I know that um, you are a life member now of the uh, Netball Jamaica, but it, from 2017, you've been director of St. Martin Netball and you were still are. Um, 2018, you became president of the America's Federation of Netball Associations and still are. And also you are regional America's director of the International Netball Federation. So it just shows that you are multi-talented and, and people are recognizing everything that you've done. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about netball, but before I get, get deeper into it, I'm sure that our listeners will want to know about the achievements that you have been honored for because there are many. So let me start by saying that you received the Carrera Sports Foundation Award for Outstanding Service in the Field of Netball in 2000. In tw 2007, the
The government of Jamaica gave you the order of distinction in the rank of officer class for service in the field of sport and community service. In 2009, GC Foster College of Physical Education and Sport uh, honored you for your outstanding contribution to the, the development of netball. RGR Sports has also given you awards, University of Technology, um, and in 2013, you got the International Netball Federation Service Award. Uh, Scotia Bank as well re recognized you for unwavering dedication to netball in 2013. And um, you got the Lifetime Achievement Award for Sport from the Gleaner in 2015, and also from the RGR Sports Foundation, uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award. Wow. 2016, Scotia Bank got awarded you for your passionate advocacy, dedicated administration, and visionary leadership outstanding service and sterling contribution to the development and growth of netball in Jamaica. And in 2016 as well, the Caribbean Development uh, for the Arts, Sports and Culture Foundation in association with the Caribbean community and UNESCO um, put you into the Caribbean Hall of Fame in recognition of outstanding contribution in the field of sport. So you are definitely an icon in your own right so we're really delighted to have you as a UE Pelican back on the show telling us all about you. Um, and now let me just say and dive back really into netball because I think you're known as the chief driving force behind a local netball um, when you started with Jamaica Netball Association. And your tenure, um, during your tenure, the public image of, the, of Jamaica's leading women's Sport, which is netball, was taken to new heights. So did how tell us about how you managed to do this. Did you set out to do it? And how did you do it? Was it through promotion and advertising? Um, you know, how did you kind of take netball out of the secret dark corner it was in and 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 build it? Okay, I netball was never in a secret dark corner before I got it, Celia. Honest to God. I uh, I I I, I I know you could say secret corner, but not dark. <laughs> I, I came into netball nationally with Molly Rohn asking me to be her treasurer when she decided to run for the presidency of Jamaica Netball Association. We have had some really great presidents. Um, before Molly was Vilma MacDonald, Margaret Beckford founded Janie in 19... 59. And we've had Avril Crawford, Sharon Donaldson was before me, Vilma Molly, and a number of really great presidents. And what I did was I like to say I stood on their shoulders so I could see far. One of my one of my lecturers I is supposed to have been credited with that phrase of standing on shoulders, but I don't think it was he who actually was the originator of it, right? Professor Gervon. But I took over netball from Sharon Donalds, who took over from Molly. And what I did was decided that this was not going to be the best kept secret in the land anymore. And so what I did, remember now, I, have, I was actually Jamaica Netball Association's treasurer for years 1993 to 2005. During that period of time, Molly Rohn asked me to come with her to the, I, it was IFNA at the time, the International Board, and I was elected unopposed as the finance director. Those days, I used to get the accounts sent to me in Jamaica, and I would do them and then send them back to England. So I served for 11 years on the board of IFNA and I made some wonderful connections with ladies and men from the top teams in the world. So while I was making all these connections and picking their brains and learning how they did things, I had a stint at FinSAC and then I went to GIS where I met up with Carmen Kipling because I was also the finance director at JS from 2000 on, um, I'm not sure, 2000 to 2009. So while I'm there, you know, I'm exposed to public relation and image. Image 
No, I had the image part with the girls down pat because once Molly and I got in there, we wanted them to have this look. Image. Don't chew gum at all in there. You build my McDonald and Marion. You don't chew gum in the uniform. See this day. I don't know what's happening now, but the older ones know. I was in an interview, was listening to Romel about a few weeks ago doing an interview, and she said, I better stop chewing the gum before Miss B, because she knew I was on the program before Miss B have something to say. Because we have to have that image of confidence and you don't see. Well, just ladies chewing gum, like the basketballers. But what prepared me to do what I did, remember now I'm learning to deal with various personalities, you know, from, 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 from Air Jamaica, right? And I knew my figures and I'm very proud of, and I'm very satisfied and confident of how I approach anything to do with money that doesn't belong to me. I can squander my own. But I make sure that if I am the custodian of your books, you can go to your bed and sleep at night and leave me. I will keep good books and I will account honestly and fairly and timely for the money that sponsors and clubs have put into, into it. So learning image, if you look at how Netball Jamaica always had annual general meetings and the accounts were always there. Molly always had a friend to beg and she taught me how to beg. I didn't know I could beg as good as her, but when trouble take you, pick and short fit you. So when she left and Sharon left, I had to, to find the resources. And it was, it was not easy, but I believed in the fact that these national treasures because I told one the other day, please do not say we spoiled you because you are national treasures. I heard somebody speak about the reggae boys as national treasures. Then my girls are national treasures too. So we got up every day. I know I got up every day to make sure that there was money in Jamaica's netball to take care of the national players. We have two we have we who are leaders of sporting associations are there because of the people we serve. So we have clubs and we have national teams. And I made sure that the sponsors for the clubs who had teams playing in leagues were on board every year. So I took care of my clubs in that I went to the sponsors and I accounted for every dollar that they gave and at the end of the season I presented a income statement and showed them how it is I did a budget, show them what we need and how we accounted for it. So I made sure that the clubs were taken care of and with their sponsors coming back every year because of how we sponsors are not benevolent people giving them money because they don't have anything to do with it, you know. But our sponsors were very important to us. They came to everything we had. We made much of them as I get on TV already. I'm calling BNS, I'm calling Berger. So we took care of that. Though not after you finish taking care of the, the clubs now, the national players come next. So I had to hustle really hard for them. And so that is why the image is important, which is why the, I mean, I remember being at GIS with Mrs. Stiplin and she did the government's budget which was a legal paper document full of a, a book, book bound with a pretty, 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 pretty cover. And when you open the book, it's pure spreadsheet in there. But guess what? You see, when you put the book down on the table, and never forget, we went to Parliament to, to present GIS's budget. And the way the book cover pretty, and never forget, James, the <laughs> only member of Parliament, asked and said, can I see this? Because it was so pretty. When you open the book, you know, not one picture in there, spreadsheet, but it was so attractive. She wanted to see it. So what did I do? I asked the same people who did all these pretty covers to come and do our annual reports, pretty covers. So when I go to a sponsor, I put down my pretty cover annual report on the desk. Because in it, 
is the audited financial statements. No AGM is kept during up to my time. No AGM up to my time can ever be kept. And the audited financial statements are not in there. We hold it out for that. And so those things I learned from GIS, which made me now do what Molly and Vilma then didn't do, just publicize. But all of those things about annual reports and how the girls were dressed and how they carried themselves, those things were being done by those other presidents too. But now I wanted everybody in Jamaica to know about the Sunshine Girls. So anything I see going on that football do, I do too. So if I wanted money exchange, and I was, let me tell you something. You have to love them to lead them. And those of us who, who have children know that they will walk on water for their children to ensure that they have what they need to succeed. That's what me and my crew did when I was up to when I was there. Because without them, there is no me. Absolutely. If absolutely no me without them. Right. I went everywhere with them, Celia. If them going to get up in the morning at five o'clock to run on the beach, I'm not running with them, you know. But I am up and have my coffee and I'm out there with them in the bus or in my car. I tell people, leading sporting associations can be extremely stressful. But let me tell you, for, for 10 years as president, because when I was the treasurer of the figures don't talk. You don't need to look at your account for them. And if it's wrong, you rub it out and you get it ready good to go. You see, when you're the president, no one dealing with all different kind of people and the different personalities. Oh, oh you better. And it brought me closer to God every time I take over a sporting association. I get closer to God. Because if I, I when I was the accountant, you know, I never said, Father God is what this, you know. But you see, the day I became president of Jamaica Netball Association and president of AFNA, every day I said, Father God, this is what this now. Father God, this is what this now. And a girlfriend of mine who is more spiritual and biblical than that, me said, that is why you're there. Father God wants you to come close to him. I ask him for help every minute. But with the Sunshine Girls, we didn't want, what Mrs. Swan told me one thing when she gave me the position as manager, and I don't want them to worry about them uniform or they get into training, what they're going to eat. When the Prime Minister of Jamaica, who was my batchmate on campus, the Honorable Bruce Golding, called me after our 50th anniversary banquet and I made a speech about a dream that I had. Because I wasn't the person that wanted the, this netball house or this bus. But here comes me now. And every 10 years, my batch on campus would have a reunion. And guess when was the 10th reunion? One year for us, the 40th reunion. In 1969, when, I mean, 2009, was 40 years. And guess who is hosting the reunion? Honorable Blue School. Because he was Prime Minister. And this time we spell off at to make a house. Yes, we step up in life. It was Bruce who hosted it that year. We take turns in hosting it. And we all were saying what we're doing. Who is at the Bank of Jamaica? Who is where I'm doing netball? Begging clothes, begging shoes, everything. And we spoke about what we wanted for each of us in our, in our service life, avocation. And when we went to the bank with the night, we, I had a speech. I said, these girls have been playing their hearts out. And I remember one of the living volatile areas. And when we came home with a medal and the Prime Minister called us all to Jamaica House and some of the girls wanted to go home early. I said, you don't see the Prime Minister have us up here. You can't want go home early. Them said, miss, violence in my area. Violence in my area. So they don't have to leave the festivities and the bus have to carry them home. The one bus that Kevin and Wireless gave us. And I told all of those things to the Prime Minister. And no less than four days later, I got a call. He called it a week. Prime Minister would like to see you down at Jamaica House. And by the time when 
when I'm with the prime minister, says, yes, prime minister, no prime minister, but when we're doing this, what, what I do now? It was, he put us in his Volvo, me, the, prime, the minister of sport, Honorable Babsy, and the commissioner of lands, and the, 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 the police outrider, yes, we drove all the way up Pope Road to a lovely property and I'm sitting on acres of land. And by this time, now in Australia, I'm saying, this is what I think it is. God has smiled on us, yes. Prime Minister walked through every room in that house as if he was buying it for his daughter. He didn't just hear the key. And my girlfriend, who is a commissioner of land, said, what are you lucky? Because we have bills to pay, you know, and I asked the Prime Minister, you don't have anything to do. You have bills to pay now. You know what he said, Celia? These girls deserve it. They have brought glory to this country. They deserve this. So that was the beginning of Netball House? Yes. Ah, yes. okay. Wonderful. I'll tell you something. It was a labor of love. My family and my family of friends I wanted that house to be house beautiful. So when I leave that house to see that with those girls, I want to leave them with cable, with telephone, with nice furniture, courts came on board and house beautiful, HGTV, I said. And I got up every day. And, I, and this is when I realized how Jamaican people are good and kind. I remember there was a garage. I used to hang out at Hagen Dazs on a Friday with Dawn, right? And we used to eat ice cream and like us here to make a group. And I saw a Mr. Todd of blessed memory. He was in construction. I said, Mr. Todd, go home and give us a house you know, you can't come help me. So what do you want? He said, no, 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 you're not in a construction, come help me. And he came to the house before I got there, see you here. And he called me and he said, you say you want me to help and me is at the house and you're not here. I said, I soon come because by this time, see, the God has been good to me, you know, guess how far the house is from my home? Three minutes. Oh my goodness. Three minutes. Yes. So I said, Mr. 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 Todd are coming. And Celia, Mr. Todd took that garage and turned it into an office for me. What he the went inside the house and he enclosed the room so that the girls would have a bathroom big enough to hold two showers and two play spaces. And he just did it out of his own resources and said, this is for them. Jamaican people love the Sunshine Girls and you have to put them out there because when they are out there, they their shoulders are back. Absolutely. They come from humble circumstances. And guess what? We instill in all of them the importance of education. So last month, one graduated from UTEC. Some of them are at UE. And it is something that Molly and I and Vilma and Sharon instill in them. And Malaysia, UE prof has been really good to me. Prof Shirley. Right. Prof, I have a sunshine girl. And, and these are the things, Celia, that warm my heart about my tenure. I tell people all the time, the greatest lessons in life I learned, not from the Jamaica alone, it's a different thing, you're getting paid. Here in serving Jamaica netball, the greatest lessons in life I learned from dealing with the, 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 the cut and thrust of the clubs and them demands and you can't please them. You see the joy, sheer joy, unadulterated joy comes from managing the national teams. Yes. That's what brought me joy. And, and so actually, I think a lot of people feel that from you as well and share it. Um, I have two comments, one from Antigua, um, going back to when you were talking about how the importance of presentation and fiscal responsibility and a graduate saying that that's something that they are learning in their job and can identify with. And another graduate from Dominica um, just saying that they don't have sunshine girls, but it sounds like a wonderful concept and congratulating you on, on, on what you have produced. Um, I just want to talk now quickly as we're winding down. I know that in 2019, um, when you were in, 
in England, I think it was, at the, you're, you are, you're lobbying to have a place at the 2022 Central American and Caribbean Games in Panama. Yes. And you're trying to get um, the members into that. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that because that is another uh, achievement that you're vying for. Well, um, netball is the best kept secret, yeah? And everybody wants to go into the Olympic, but you have to, to get into more multidisciplinary games to get in there. You have to play more matches amongst themselves. And I'm not president for the Caribbean. I want to make it very clear. I am president for North, South, Central America, and the Caribbean. My, my, my stakeholders in North, South, and Central America feel very left out at times. So I'm always mindful of saying that I am president for the Americas region. And what we need to do is to get into more multidisciplinary games, multidiscipline games, so that the teams can play more ranking matches, gain ranking points, and move up in the INF ranking. So we're trying to get into the CAC games, and that's easier than in the Pan Am games because all 14 countries are in the Caribbean and we started the lobby. But what the, what the organizers want to be sure of is that we're not a Caribbean English speaking sport alone. So we've got to spread our wings into the Spanish and the French. Guadeloupe is now a, a member and they speak French and they're so enthusiastic. And anything we can do out of our resources to help them to play the game is going to help. What has affected us a little negatively like most things is COVID because the games are going to be in Panama and the, the executive of the, or the carpet as the new name have agreed that netball should be on the game discipline. But with Panama not hosting the games in 2022 again, our plans, forward plans have sort of had a little hiccup there, but hope springs eternal in my breast. And so I do believe that in time, we're going to get in there because the people who are at the helm of Odekabe know what we want. And I have been staying very close to them so that they don't forget about me and my netball. And hopefully before I demit office in 2022, will be a reality. And then after that, now we try for the Pan Am Games. And Absolutely. Then we, yeah. Okay, yeah. wonderful. It sounds fabulous. Um, I know too that you have now with um, an AFNA, which is the American Federation of Netball Associations, um, a link now with, by getting some assistance from the Faculty of Sport at UWI. So maybe you'd like to speak a little bit about that. Oh, my Dr. saying. You know, yes. let me tell you something, Celia. Throughout life, you come upon people who buy into your dreams and your vision. And Dr. Mansing has helped my girls from so far back. Sometimes I forget how far back he, he has been helping me with these ladies. And so everything to do with sport, we have been blessed. With, 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 with Doc and when the idea came that we were not going to sit down and roll over and do nothing with COVID here, we decided to do some governance webinars and there being a department of sport headed by my colleague friend, Dr. Mansing, asking him if he would help us and guess what? He sent Kerwin Jean and that, those, that Saturday when Kerwin spoke, I, the thing went on for over two hours more than the time allotted to it. How, interesting it was. So I'm really anxious to hear what else is in Dr. Mansing's mind, but between him and Claudette Coote Thompson and Kerwin Jean, we spent eight Saturdays upskilling, led by Kerwin Beckford, upskilling and sharing best practices and knowledge with our colleagues in the Americas. And that was something that warmed our heart that we were able to do despite COVID, you know? It, I tell people all the time, those of us in sports, COVID has just put more work on the off-court activities, you know, the on-court activities have stalled, but, the off but it's heartwarming work. And so Dr. Mansing is near and dear to my heart. 
he has always helped me in sharing his ideas. Um, looking after my knee, I can't play again, but I, he's my doctor too, and he's my doctor colleague. So he, he and I are going to have some discussions come 2021 to see how we can continue this partnership with my alma mater, my, my UWI, and with Department of Sport that my Shami just won. And I'm so proud that she is that sports person. The only thing I tell her, she's living in the wrong house. She should be in Taylor Hall. But, you know, <laughs> can't have it all. I that's right. I mean, yeah, that's all. true. So I just said to, to underscore for our listeners that um, netball was the sport that, that came out on top in the Vice Chancellor's 2020 um, um, Sportsman and Sportswoman of the Year. And Shamira Sterling, who Marva knows very well, is one of her girls, one of um, babies. Was, is now the Sportswoman, the Vice Chancellor's Sportswoman of the Year for 2020. And I had the pleasure of meeting her um, just a couple of days ago. Um, as you say, with COVID, things are, have, have changed radically because normally we'd have had an in-person um, event in terms of the awards, but we had to go virtual. And Marva was one of the guest surprise celebrities that came on and congratulated the awardees. And I know that uh, she added greatly to the event, but we're really proud of Shamira and happy that Netball had the spotlight, spotlight shine on it. Um, one of the things that you had said when I was talking to you as well uh, about sports is that sports, a lot of people feel that it's only for people in the sporting circles, but in fact, it's something that teaches all of us um, good team building skills, builds character, teaches respect and so on. So perhaps you could just kind of expound on that for a little bit. Um, as I said, in my journey, while I was the treasurer of Jamaica Netball Association, and by the way, I, I, I did commercial law on campus, and I therefore was able to have a good understanding when we incorporated Jamaica Netball Association, because take the gift of the government house, we had to incorporate ourselves, because when I went for the key, my friend said, no, 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 can't give the government property to an unincorporated entity, so there, they can that. So being in sport, you get to use your, your, your knowledge that you studied while it's on campus, your secondary, your, your, your tertiary, um, education. You also learn how to deal with various types of people. For me, I could not have survived and I expect to continue to survive the next last legs of my service to sport because I'm a better person for having sports. You give, you take, you win, you lose. You have to, you have to learn how to lose. I remember taking a team to Canada my under 21 players to Canada and they beat Canada with a cricket score. And I remember we were able to, we were having friends with the Canadians because some of them had Jamaican parents and all, all the days before that match, everything was fine. And then after the match, after we beat them, went to breakfast the next morning and they weren't talking to my team or me. And the manager came and said, you know, your girls were very nice. Because what they did was they got, got the names of, of my players and called them when they caught the ball. And so the poor pitney them frightened and threw the ball away and stuff like that or threw it to them. So it says, come Marvel, and it's not Marvel calling you, right? So anyway, I gathered my girls together and I, I read them the riot act. I said, look, we have to learn how to lose and be gracious can't and you know they haven't forgotten that ever that lesson so sports teaches you how to win how to lose and because you're dealing with young people and worse now the way the society gets more challenging to teach people values right i could open my eyes on the under on 21s and said listen to me now or look down my glasses and say look listen to me now this is what it is when they got older, you had a different way of showing them, as you would say, how school keep and how life is. But sport teaches you values. It gives you, you play the game fairly. 
one of my colleagues who joined me on my journey gave the netball a Sunshine Girls a netball a tagline. And the first time I, I said it to this to the stadium full of the clubs and the netballers, the tagline is netball, play it with passion, live it with pride. And I tell people all the time, the girls are poor and they're both and they're proud. So you have to learn empathy and how to deal with them. And all of this comes from out of sport because it's not a find that middle class and upper middle class people and rich people's children don't play sport. But if they play sport, they're not playing mine. And by the time they get to fifth form or fourth form, they have buckled down and study so their parents pull them out. That mixture of, of, of social classes are not there because the, the ones who could teach my ones how to use knife and fork and how to whatever and take them in their home, stop playing because they want to study for them, whatever it name, SBR, them, this and that, and leave my own fending for themselves to play their sports because guess what? some of them are more independent than the dependent children of the middle class parents. So I became that person that would be looking about how I get the homework done and what the values are. So sports, believe me, Celia, there's no words that I can, I'm a better person for having been around all of these children and these young people. For at my age, I can say children, but all of these young people, because they teach me empathy. They teach me how to, 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 to realize that somebody needs help and is too poor to come and ask for it. So you have to know that they need some help, but she's not going to ask. So you have to. This is only, you only get this way. One of the ways you get to be like this is by being in sport. And rich people, children, not playing poor people, children, sport. Same thing. And I say it without fear of any contradiction. Netball don't have, in all my life of being in netball, I've only had one parent when I was managing who could buy his child a pair of sneakers. And I would say, Peter, um, Danish needs a pair of sneakers and he'd buy it. The rest of them, I had to hustle it. I had to beg it. Or netball, to make a netball association, I had to find somebody to buy it. So I know what it is to buy a pair of sneakers for somebody and you slip it to them some second night seekers and you wash them. You don't give it to them dirty, you wash them. And these things, empathy, teaches you empathy. Sports teach you empathy. And if you really are in it and recognize that leaders eat last and eat least, you need to come to sports and don't. For me now, Celia, because I've joined Air Jamaica to see the world when I, I don't have to travel. It's not about the travel that I go on about the per diem that I get. Leaders eat last. All of what you have belongs to the athletes who are doing the work out there. So you can't take more pocket money than them. You can't eat before they eat. If it's the one seat, one slice of bread leave out of the bread, back bread, you don't eat it. And I grew up knowing that. Grew up in netball knowing that. And I stay same place where they stay eat the same food that they eat in the same hotel. And as I said, I eat last. Unless I go there and I see enough, then I don't eat until they eat. And when you come off the plane, I make sure that their hair is coiffed nicely. And if it's the cheap false hair they're having, I said, and I used to travel with a brush because the media is going to be out there and they would laugh and I would use my sense of humor. I said, look how you're pretty now that you're only here. Because I'd be at the back of the plane watching them passing me, you know. Okay. And I said, now put on your lipstick. We have the media coming. We have to create an image because the sponsors are good. And let me tell you something. After a while, they knew. They knew. They were my gifts from God and I treat them just like that. National treasures. And I learned to care for them I don't eat until they eat. I think what you have said is, is very enlightening. And I've gotten some comments that you've been speaking that it's extremely enlightening. Um, as you say, they are our national treasures. And I'm sure other people in the Caribbean who have equivalent sports, 
teams or whatever feel the same thing and, and, and all the things you've been enunciating and what they yeah, said too. It is the president's responsibility if you take up the position of president of Jax, it is your responsibility to go out there and find the money to the players who are playing the jacks. You right. know what one, one, one player showed me, Celia? Um, under my term, I gave them a stipend, pocket money. You know why? They work or they go to school and they have to come to training four or five times a week. So they can't get like a coaching job on the side. And the player said, you know, Miss B, Sheila over there can coach that team, you know, because she's not training four days a week. And when you finish training, you go home and they curse them and they take so long to do their exams. Why, Celia? A degree that takes me three years will take my national player five. Why? Because she's traveling over the world representing this country. Absolutely. And people quarrel and don't want to help them. I've cried. I am very proud. I've cried several tears because not, not everybody buying TV vision and want to help you, you know. So every time I get a no, I take it personally. I go away and cry, dry my tears and get it back and come back and find somebody else to help. Because it is my responsibility as the president to find the resources. Don't tell me about committee. I have, I signed on to lead. I signed on to lead. So I have to know when I get up every day, Celia, how I'm going to put a pot of food on the table. You see, when girls are traveling long distances and staying weeks and they have family back here, we leave and ensure that their family, how they eat. I don't want them worrying about how them child eat when they're playing my last match and them child do have food. Okay, yes. No, it's very, very true. And I've gotten comments from Florida, from the Bahamas, from Trinidad, supporting what you're saying and saying that especially your point about empathy, how it teaches you empathy, because people from all walks of life speak, um, play sports. It teaches respect, honor, discipline, resilience, perseverance. These are some of the comments that have been coming through. So you've really struck a chord with a lot of people. So I hope you're pleased about that. But now it's come to the time where we have to close. It's been a pleasure having you. I hope my fellow Pelicans that you've enjoyed today's Pelican Talks with our distinguished guest, Mrs. Marvel I don't Bernard. know about distinguishing every time very, I hear that. Very word, distinguished. You are distinguished. <laughs> and I would like to thank Howard Shand, our digital media and database manager who facilitates this as well and works with me. We look forward to you joining our next Pelican Talk where we will engage alumni across the Caribbean and world uh, in novel and enriching exchanges once more. So Marva, thanks again. It has been a true pleasure. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And until next time, remember to show your pelican pride. Thank you all. Have a great evening or Thank afternoon or morning, depending on the time zone. <laughs> Thanks, Marva. Take care.